It's time for another episode of Espresso Yourself with Chuck. And now, coming to the mic, your host, Mr. Chuck Knapp. My guest today is a five-time Hall of Famer. He's been named National Coach of the Year five times, is known internationally as an extraordinary sports marketing professional, but to many people, he is probably best known as a person who saw greatness in an assistant football coach named Bill Snyder and hired Bill Snyder to turn around what arguably was the worst football program in the history of college football and turned it into a perennial football powerhouse at Kansas State University. It is a pleasure to welcome Steve Miller to Espresso Yourself with Chuck. Thank you. Happy to be here and uh, looking forward to our conversation. Well, I'm just curious, just right off the bat, how many times do you think you've been asked about hiring Bill Snyder in your lifetime? I Certainly more than once and probably less than a million. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's, some, it's something right in there. I, you know, I interviewed 18 coaches um, of varying skill sets and, and varying, um, uh, uh, some of them were in the big five schools and some of them were, you know, smaller. And uh, it was an education for me. I mean, it was something that was really fascinating because all 18 coaches had fractionally different looks at how things should be done. And Bill was one of the last people I interviewed uh, he was at the University of Iowa, offensive coordinator, and um, I called Bo Schembechler at the time, who was at Michigan, and said to Bo, you know, I'm looking at Bill Snyder, what do you think? And Bo's answer, and I'll leave one word out, but Bo's answer was, <laughs> get him the F out of our league. So, so I said, that's as good as anybody can say. But what I also did was um, I talked to, at the time, Bill had, and I'd have to think about the year, but Bill had three quarterbacks in the NFL. And, and I called each one of the quarterbacks and, and to talk to him about Bill and his persona and so forth and so on. And one of the answers that I got uh, that was really interesting from all three was that you could, that your quarterback could throw a perfect pass and you'd come off the field feeling good. You'd either have a touchdown or you'd have, you know, some big gain. And, and Bill would say, you know, his number is 89 and you threw it a little bit on the eight side. You got to really get that thing down, down the middle. So uh, these three quarterbacks couldn't have been more, um, you know, more effusive and, and excited about Bill. And uh, Bill was an assistant. But off of that um, team that he was in on, University of Iowa, several coaches really ended up going on to, um, uh, to four-star, five-star programs. I mean, uh, the head coach of the University, was, University of Wisconsin was a defensive coordinator, now is the director of athletics at Wisconsin, um, and several other people really, um, he had a great staff. And I think that when people talk about the Big Ten, they spend most of their time talking about Ohio State and Michigan. And the truth is the University of Iowa, over a period of time, if you, you know, take the time to look at it, you'll find out that they've won a, a whole bunch of Big Ten championships. They've been very successful. And Hayden Fry, who was the head coach, just did a great job. But Bill was, um, uh, was interesting. He uh, methodical, uh, intelligent. Um, very, very focused. Um, and that's what made him, you know, a, a great coach. And, and sometimes, um, you know, people wouldn't, does not, do not want to spend that time, you know, the time it takes, you know, to, to be great. And, um, you know, you get frustrated, et cetera, et cetera. Bill was, um, he was relentless. Work ethic was unbelievable. Uh, time spent, you know, doing his job and, you know, understanding due diligence on other teams. So he was, and by the way, uh, geographically, he was a product of, of Kansas and Missouri. He lived in that part of the country and, and as a result was much more appealing to me because he knew the temperament um, and some of the things that went on in the Midwest, which a lot of people did not. So um, 
The hiring was difficult. Uh, and I adopted a philosophy of no matter what he asked, I just said yes. Whether I could do it or not, I had no idea. But I just I just kept on saying yes and just wore him down. And finally he came and 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 the rest is history. I mean, he did a fabulous job, fabulous job. And I uh, um, still talk to a lot of the players that uh, played for Bill in that first year. Um, one of them, Chad Faulkner, he was an offensive tackle um, and he was the captain, the first captain of Bill's team. Chad and I do a lot of business together and, and it's, you know, it's carried over from football into life, which, which I find to be, you know, be the case. Um, if you're diligent in one area, generally you're diligent in other areas as well. Well, and, and I want to go back um, because that's one of the life lessons and just recognizing greatness. Also, I want to know how you developed that ability. And so if you wouldn't mind, let's go back to the early days of your, of your life. Uh, where did you grow up? Uh, what were your aspirations? Uh, we know you were a track star later, but, but tell us a little bit about what you wanted to do or what you thought you wanted to do uh, in your younger life and, and, and how that all kind of came together. Well, it, that's a, a really a great question that I don't get asked all that often. You know, you uh, when you do an interview, generally they talk about what where you are today and you know what you did in a short period of time. I'm I'm from Chicago. I went to Amundsen High School in the city, uh, and when people say they're from Chicago, they often are from Lagrange or York or other places. I lived in Chicago, so went to a high school, uh, Amundsen High School, which was uh, which was great and. Um, uh, an inner city high school, uh, primarily made up of first generation Americans. Um, uh, and I had been uh, very, very shy, um, you know, under, you know, as a freshman, sophomore, a junior in high school. But I had a, I had kind of a gift. I, I was very fast. I, I ran track and uh, did very, very well, was in the finals of almost every major race in the country. Um, and the, the truth, the truth check is that I adopted a feeling of what would I like? How would I like to be treated? What, what is it that, that makes me feel good? What is it that makes me feel like I want to compete and that the coach and I would have a relationship that I did not want to let him down. And as a result, I was I was very attached to the program. Plus, I was a, um, you know, I was a running holic, not a, not a alcoholic, but a running holic. And, and I, you know, was a, a pretty aggressive trainer and I trained hard, um, you know, I spent time in the weight room, spent time doing other things, read a lot about biomechanics, uh, et cetera. And my, my dream when I was young was what could I bring to a group of young people who are, in some cases, you know, very focused and doing very well. Uh, but I was mostly interested in those young men uh, and women, which I started several women's programs um, that were not focused, that were having problems at home, uh, that those problems were showing themselves on the field or showing themselves, you know, in competition. Um, and, and my feeling was, that I couldn't help everybody, but I would very, at very least, try to help the people uh, that I was closest to. And again, it got back to how was I treated? What was it that turned me on, you know, to uh, to becoming the best I could be? Uh, and I wanted to transfer that to young people. And it was, um, you know, a labor of love. And as I got older, and as time went by. You know, I had a couple of young Olympians. I had some Olympians that that, that won medals in the Olympic Games. Um, I played football and I played and I ran track. Interestingly enough, on the football side, I did not play football in high school. Uh, and I didn't play football in college until I was a sophomore. Um, and the head coach, who, Billy Stone, was a former Chicago Bear. And one thing I could do was run. And even though I could not, even though I didn't have a 
a handle on, you know, football jargon and football, you know, what, what made up a football player. I wouldn't say I was a very smart player, uh, but I, but I honed, you know, all those edges and honed all those skill sets that I did have. And um, uh, it was, you know, it's a great experience, but for me, uh, the, the driving force absolutely was what could I do to impact the life of, of the kids that I was involved with. And I would just add this, as I coached and as I spent time uh, with young people, one of the things that came up, uh, and these were high school kids, one of the things that came up were what we call aha moments. So I would give somebody information and maybe by the time they were a sophomore or junior or whatever, they would all of a sudden, it would just hit them that it was an aha moment, a moment that, that they didn't quite understand early on and then understood very well. Uh, and I was really proud of that. I, I was really you know, excited by that. So, so my goals at the start um, and carried on for you know, decades was what am I going to do to make their lives better? What am I going to do to make my life feel fulfilled? And how could I use sport as a platform for them to see the world in a broader sense? And, and it was, uh, you know, a labor of love and uh, never made a lot of money initially, but, but uh, it was something I was, you know, dedicated to. When did that, that calling uh, come to you? Was it, was there something in your childhood or in your life that, that, that made it important to you uh, to help others and treat them kind of the way you wanted to be treated? Or, um, you know, was it college that you developed that? What, can you explain where that came from? Yeah, it, it, it really came from two distinct places. One was um, the, the high school program. I went from the inner city school to a suburban school, and I was able to take a look at how kids were you know, educated. I might not have been, um, you know, uh, I, I, it might not have all been clear to me, but some things were very obvious. Um, when we would go to a competition in Chicago, you had to take public transportation and you had to find the school and, you know, you had to bring your own equipment. And I, re I remember uh, when I went to my first high school track meet at, uh, at Niles High School, um, I asked the coach, how do you get, we were going to walk Keegan. And I said, well, how do you get there? And he said, well, what do you mean? How do you get there? And I said, well, you know, how do you get there? And, and he said, no, no, just meet us at four o'clock at this place. And we have a bus. So uh, I went to the bus and I thought it was like the greatest thing ever. And all the other kids that had been at school we're complaining about the bus. It's a school bus. It's crap. It's no good. It's et cetera, et cetera. And I realized the difference between how I was growing up and, and what was important to me and what I saw and these other kids who were from suburbs feeling like the very same thing that I appreciated, they couldn't appreciate at all. And, and as a result, I saw this incredibly wide chasm of difference between perspectives. And I wanted uh, those kids that, that had different perspectives uh, to, to, uh, um, to engage in a new perspective. And, and, and it, was, uh, it was something that really hit me. Now, what, what, what really did it was I was drafted to play professional football and, and uh, um, I was drafted by Detroit and I played uh, two games and got hurt and uh, severed the perineal nerve in my right leg. So I had no feeling in my right leg from my knee down. And in addition to that, had a drop foot. And that was that meant that my foot was just dropped because the perineal nerve is the nerve that raises your, your foot. So I knew in a very short period of time, I was not gonna be a professional football player, that I was in fact crippled for all practical purposes. And the connection was at that time, we're talking about, you know, the 60s and, and um, uh, polio was really a rampant at the time before they found a cure. And um, I was, I had to wear a brace 
for 20 years, a steel brace uh, to keep my foot elevated. And um, I knew that my dream was over and I wanted to make sure that I could intercede in, in people's lives about, about helping them get through the dreams that didn't come true and also helping them see that there are other things you can do um, and get the same joy out of it. So when I played, I thought this was the answer. And later when I didn't play, I thought maybe the answer was here or maybe the answer was in my heart. And it changed my trajectory to feel like there were lots and lots of kids that were unable to fulfill their dream for lots of reasons, lack of resources, lack of physical resources, lack of good coaching, you know, lack of, of a variety of things. So those two issues really uh, were indelible in my mind, and they were the catalyst for me really developing um, a system of sorts uh, that addressed, you know, addressed those issues. And we were all going through, young people were all going through um, lost dreams. Some of them were uh, athletic, some of them were, you know, were, you know, other, other things, uh, overcoming the family that you lived with. Um, did you have parents? Did you have brothers and sisters? And I realized that all of those factors factored into the capability of a young person to succeed. And, and succeeding was driven by parents, driven by coaches. And, and, and I, I would stop here and say this, that uh, coaches had an enormous influence on, on young people because you were spending a, a, a lot of time with that coach. And if that coach really understood your situation uh, as it related beyond the field, they could make a, you know, a, a comparison between what was going on over here uh, on your home front and how you were translating that uh, to, um, uh, to competition. And, and I realized that you could um, uh, make changes, that you could identify issues um, if you spent the time doing diligence beyond their skills. And you became a track coach. Uh, became a track, track coach, coach and a football coach. I coached football in high school as well as, as track. And we were, you know, we were champions every year and we were, we were very good. And uh, I think if you came out to one of our practices, you would have seen something a little different than that was constant communication with the athletes, constant conversation. And it wasn't just repetitive uh, hand the ball off, you know, I do a fake or do this or do that. I wanted them to know why we were doing it. And I wanted them to know the part that they were playing in it. And I wanted to, them to know that what they did affected other players on the team. You, you were a head track coach and then you were hired by K state to be head track coach. Right. Uh, what, why did you want to go to Kansas state? What to, to come back to the Midwest, if you will? Well, I was, you know, I was at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, had an enormous amount of success. We won several national championships, had kids that went to the Olympic games. Um, and the reason that I went to uh, uh, Kansas state was the last Dodds was the AD. And he was one of the first ADs in the country that had a track background. Generally ADs at universities are former football coaches, former basketball coaches, and then later became former bankers. And, you know, the, as the, as the landscape of, of college changed, uh, when money became an issue, et cetera, et cetera, um, they looked for a different kind of leadership. So I went because he was a track coach. He understood, you know, what we were trying to do. Uh, but as I was going to Kansas State, unbeknownst to me, he was going to Texas and he became the director of athletics at the University of Texas, served, I think, 20 years there, had enormous success, was really very, very good. And what happened is I got to Kansas State 
<clears throat> it was a very difficult place to coach, a very difficult place to recruit to. The geography was not, you know, especially good. As the Midwest, you have the strong winters, uh, et cetera. So it put a lot of stress on all of us in terms of trying to get the right kids. And um, I coached for three years and we hired a new director of athletics from Georgia Tech. And he asked me if I'd be interested in fundraising because one of my skills was telling interesting stories, talking to people, you know, where they live and so forth and so on. And I had amassed a certain amount of knowledge and, and I wanted to pass it on. And, and, um, and I did. And I, I became a fundraiser for a year. And then I knew it wasn't my thing. I, uh, telling the story was fun. Asking for the money was not fun. So, um, so I ended up uh, leaving Kansas State and became uh, the National Director of Special Olympics. And the reason I got involved in Special Olympics is a very good friend of mine, Jim Santos, his son was in Special Olympics in a special program. And um, what happened was Jim asked me if I would speak at um, a conference that they were having for five states, Oklahoma, Missouri, uh, Oklahoma, uh, Kansas, you know, the states that kind of touched each other. And there were several hundred people there, including uh, Eunice Kennedy Shriver and Sergeant Shriver. And they heard me speak. And, you know, if I say so myself, I was a great storyteller and, you know, I was able to, you know, get some things out. And I talked primarily about volunteers, not about, you know, other things. I talked about the value of volunteers, how much money programs saved, what it was that, what stimulated volunteers, et cetera, et cetera. When I was done, Eunice Kennedy Shriver came up to me and said, look, you have to become part of Special Olympics. And I said, well, no, I really don't have to, but you know, let's, let's talk about it. And sure enough, less than a year later, I moved to Pennsylvania, became the um, CEO of the Pennsylvania Special Olympics, and also had a seat on the Kennedy Foundation uh, and worked with them uh, for a year, a little bit more than a year. And the AD at Kansas State was fired. And they asked me if I would come back as director of athletics, which I did. Now you talk about um, uh, challenges. We were not uh, one of the worst programs in America. We were solidly the worst program in America. I think we were the first school to get to 300 losses. And then Sports Illustrated uh, one year did a front page, front page article about Kansas State, and they called it Futility U. And, and it was embarrassing. It was difficult. Uh, and it didn't do anything for our kids. Uh, and it didn't do anything for anybody. You know, fundraising went backwards and so forth and so on. So I um, had a plan and I shared that plan with two or three very wealthy donors. And they asked me how much it would cost to do what it was I was planning. And I told them it was $40 million. And um, one of them, Jack Veneer, who the stadium is named after, um, said to me, well, I, I will give you that money, but I'm not crazy about it. And I said, look, Jack, here's what we're going to do. If you'll commit the money, then I will go out and use your commitment as a validation that we're on our way to a successful program. Then I rehired one of the former ADs. Um, uh, Ernie was was a was, was played basketball at Kansas State in the fifties, and he was an older AD. And I knew that I, at the time, I was in my forties, was not going to have a great connection with some of the older donors, but Ernie would. So Ernie and I went out um, along with Verl Schweitzer and some other people. We went out and we attacked the areas that we felt we were most comfortable. And um, I told Jack Veneer that every penny that we raise will be a penny you don't have to pay. So if we were to raise $40 million, you would not put a penny in. And we raised, I think, $48 million and Jack never put a penny in. 
Now, Jack's naming of the stadium came later because he helped us do another program. So we were able to raise that money. And now we were able to go out and talk to donors and say, look, you're going to be part of this program. And if not, I'm going to remember you. I'm going to, I'm going to say bad things about you. I'm going to make your life as miserable as I possibly can. And whatever seats you have in the stadium, I'm taking them away. You can sue me. You can do anything you want, but you're not going to be part of this. And we are heading in the right direction. So fundraising skyrocketed. Um, our programs, I, I found Bill. Bill recruited spectacularly. First year, they won one game, and you would think we just won the Rose Bowl. And then uh, he started winning five and then seven. And then he went to consecutive bowl games and did things that nobody thought was possible. And what happened was, uh, I think Chuck was, he showed people um, that you don't believe your press clippings, that you don't buy into what, you know, writers and so forth said, because all of them said it was impossible. And we were, we really got good. I mean, very, very good. In fact, if you remember, or I'm sure Biz would remember, uh, we got, we became number one in the country after beating uh, Nebraska at home, um, which was unheard of. We had gone to one bowl game prior to that in 50 years of football. And now we're going to bowl games, winning games, winning the Big Eight, which at the time was called the Big Eight. And that that um, circumstance served me well as I coached track and field athletes and told them they can be more than they thought. And as a result, we had, you know, Doug Lytle and all these other kids that ended up going to the Olympic trials. I think, I think the year of the Olympic trials in LA, we had 50 athletes from Cal Poly, uh, from Kansas State, and even a couple of kids from Bloom High School, where I coached, coached high school, that made it to the Olympic trials. Kids that didn't even make it to their state meet. People that were, uh, Ivan Huff um, was a 10 minute high school two miler and uh, didn't qualify for the state meet. Four years later, he ran the third fastest steeplechase by an American ever and is still in the top 10. Um, today, um, because he knew that he had not reached his potential. He saw what people were doing and he embraced it and became a, you know, a fabulous runner. And we had a number of kids that that happened to. Uh, we had a kid named Ronnie Waynes that ultimately married a half miler, a female half miler, Aaron Fickey. They had a child. Their child was the second player picked in the NFL 15 years later. He went, he was a defensive back, played for Minnesota for six or seven years, and then played for a couple of teams and, and has since retired. But it was a matter of saying, what do you want to be? How do you get there? And let's get there together. Going back a little bit on, on the Bill Snyder that first season. Right. So, I mean, clearly you said you put a plan together, you had the plan, you went out and you got the $48 million or whatever right. it ultimately right. ended up being. This team had not won a game in three years. Right. And so I graduated from KU in 1988. Right. So I was familiar with some of those those games, uh, the tie game uh, one year where neither right. one of us could could win. Um, but you talked about futility, you K state hadn't won a game in three years. You right. come in with the plan, hire Bill Snyder, right? Clearly you had confidence in, in your plan in yourself, but was there a moment that season where you said, yes, it, it's, it's all coming together. Not maybe not the North Texas win, or maybe that was right. it, but right. was there, was there one other moment that you said, yes, absolutely. We are on track. Yeah. It, that, that's a good question. And, and, and on track means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. 
So um, uh, I'll tell you a short, funny, I, I think it's funny, but we're, we're, our opening game that year was at Arizona State, and we had a Friday dinner. And um, I was sitting next to Bill, and we had all the players there and assistant coaches, and sitting next to Bill. And in between Bill and I was a tray of butter. And, and Bill uh, said, butter. And I said, yeah, Bill, it's butter. So he said, he said uh, salted. And I said, yeah, it looks like it's salted butter. It looks like it's salted butter. Which, by the way, if you live in France, that's great. But if you live in the U.S., it may not be quite as great. So I said, yeah, it's, it's, it's salted. And he said, no butter. Get rid of it. So <laughs> the, what he calls came around. The waiters came around, took all the butter away, and brought us butter that was, I guess, homogenized, no salt, etc. So <laughs> I said to Bill, you know, you can't be serious. I mean, I, what, what, what is this? And Bill said, no, if we're going to get this done right, we're going to get it right from the ground floor to the ceiling. And every single thing that we do has to reflect doing it the right way and, and, and getting it done the way that we need to get it done. And Bill instilled in these kids, there was much less fighting much less yelling and screaming. Bill would close practices from time to time, which I wasn't crazy about. Uh, but but he held those kids to standards that they just had never been held to. And it, he lost a couple of kids, but the kids stayed on. And, and those kids that stayed on um, learned discipline. They learned sacrifice. Uh, they learned that in order to be successful, you have to go down a road uh, that is straight and narrow. And, and Bill, uh, uh, from that day on, by the way, I called Bill plain Bill because I thought, I thought that he was, he was such a, you know, he, he had such a, um, a view of the, of the world that was, that was plain. It, it, it was great, but he expected people to live up to their end of the bargain. So I never thought we were in trouble I just wondered how long it would take. I didn't know. I didn't know that because if you remember back, and I don't expect that mo most people will, I kept a heck of a lot of those, you know, articles that were just crushing Kansas State, justifiably so, but mean spirited, mean spirited, and and that went from the uh, the uh, the guy that was writing for the Kansas City paper, who's become kind of a famous you know writer and. Um, I can't remember his name offhand, but he's been on TV, et cetera. And Topeka wrote, you know, articles about, you know, how bad we were, et cetera, et cetera. And in those articles, they said, Kansas State will never be, you know, a, a power. Interestingly enough, KU is going through that right now. I mean, they've, they've made tremendous strides. However, the, the system's different because you have the open portal now and you can bring kids in. But Bill, in his own way, without ever raising his voice, without ever showing signs of, you know, of emotion, was able to get the kids to understand that we could be very good if we remained disciplined, focused, and did the little things right. And it was the little things that changed the culture. And, and I give Bill all that, all that credit. Um, Bill and I spoke a lot, a lot. And I would like to think he took up some of the ideas I had, and I certainly took up some of the ideas he had. But he was a, uh, an efficient, quiet guy with a very definite plan as to how he was going to get to where he wanted to get. And he did. And he did. It was, I don't know, maybe now people will say, you know, KU has gotten a lot of ink. Um, one of the great turnarounds in football, uh, but we had a turnaround that was miraculous. I mean, you know, Bill did a great job, and and he stayed. And when he when he when he retired, I came to Manhattan, Kansas, and gave his retirement speech and 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 uh, inducted him into the Kansas State Hall of Fame. And and Bill and I became very close, but for for other reasons than you know going out and having a beer. That wasn't what our relationship 
was based on. Our relationship was based on a on a um, uh, on a platform of of academic um, uh, strength and intellectual, you know, approach. It was based on um, uh, us being rigid about the things we had to be rigid about, and the fact that we talked to those athletes about what they could do. And that's when we started getting into a lot more self-esteem. It was the thing that really catapulted the program. And that was, you know, I am somebody, I, I have value and worth, and I hated losing and I love winning and, and I'm going to abide by all of these small things and, and Bill ultimately, and, and, the, and the players loved them. I mean, they just, they just loved them. Um, for no apparent reason, for no apparent reason, other than he brought into their lives a, a discipline that they never knew existed. And as they became more disciplined, um, they just became better. And he did it with a lot of kids that were there, uh, and then recruited, you know, his own type of what, what his own type of kid was. You had been successful prior to being athletics director at Kansas State as an athlete, as a coach. Uh, obviously, a lot of people know about what you did as athletics director at, at Kansas State. Um, but then you moved on to Nike. So even without that chapter of K-State in your life, you have an amazing career. You, you went from K-State to Nike and did some huge things there. Yeah. Why did you decide... You wanted to go to Nike, and um, you know what was what was that like working for this this company that um, is known internationally, certainly. Um, but you did some things that took it to another level with with the Olympics and some of the marketing things you did. Right, right. Yeah, that I, that's a that's another good question, Chuck. I I I um, was there at Kansas State for five years, and and. Uh, Brought in Dana Altman and had you know had Lon there, uh, had you know had Bill, and we were on the right track. Uh, and I have to admit, and I will say this freely, that I I don't get bored, but what I what I do do or what I do what I try to do is establish a solid foundation uh, that I can count on on an annual basis, and frankly. I don't think they needed me anymore. I, I, it wasn't that I was unhappy. It's just that I felt like th they didn't need me. We had built the facilities. We had changed the culture. And in five years, we were winning seven games, six games, uh, and then got to bowl games and so forth. And I thought Dana was going to be a great coach. He came in with Lon. You know, he brought Mitch Richmond in and other players. Um, and then the one year, I think Dana's, I think, uh, 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 Lons last year, we had beaten Oklahoma twice and we had beaten KU twice, and they ended up playing for the national championship. So I felt I felt like we were, you know, like like we were solid. And then when Phil Phil sent one of his planes to come and get me in Manhattan, and I had said no for for a year and maybe longer because and I this is Phil Knight, Knight, the owner of Nike. Knight. Yeah, I really liked uh, Manhattan. I, I really liked the people. I liked the um, uh, the environment. I, I I just really liked it, and I made some great friends. So uh, when Phil uh, sent the plane, I went out to Portland, Oregon, with Suzanne, my wife, and I have been married fifty three years. Uh, by the way, I'm seventy nine years old, and you know have been around for for a long time. Have seen a lot of things, and um, Phil and I had a really interesting conversation about taking my skill set and expanding it to a much larger audience and it would be a global audience so he he offered me the job to become the head of world athletics so it was track and field initially and it was a world that i knew very well and um i said no again and and i came back to manhattan uh and uh and then i was inundated with calls and so forth and so on so he sent the plane again. We went back out. Uh, and then he, he <laughs> this is absolutely true. He offered me a, a salary. 
but also offered me a sizable amount of stock. And I have to admit that that at the time I was a um, I was a business person. I, I had made money doing certain things, but I was not I was not very sophisticated, and I really didn't know what stock meant. I mean, I really wasn't sure. So he offered me 10,000 shares of stock at $30 a share. And that particular year, the stock market split, the Nike market split three times. So I uh, ended up with a chunk of money, but I even asked if the stock goes down, do I have to pay the difference? Or how does that, how does that work? And that's not a story I tell very often, but, but how does that work? And my brother-in-law is a dentist and very successful dentist said, no, 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 Steve, here's, here's how it works. So um, uh, I took the job be- because, not of the money in the stock, but because I had a platform that was much larger and I felt that I could make a change. And then Phil and I talked and after the first year, I became head of global sports marketing. So now each of the 17 sports that we had, you know, football, basketball, baseball, et cetera, et cetera. Those people that were head were reporting to me. And then I would give them direction to run their entity, their silo of activity. And we, um, we made a ton of money. We, we uh, became, you know, really special. We, our, 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 our outreach athletically was spectacular, but more spectacular was our, you know, marketing and promotion and so forth and so on. And I was involved with a lot of those, you know, a lot of those things. And we went to uh, the Olympic Games in Barcelona uh, at that time. And we did a study afterwards and, and people from Harvard and Princeton uh, who managed the study and is still available um, uh, thought that Nike was the sponsor of the Olympic Games. And we weren't, we, were, we didn't put a penny into it other than what we were doing. And everybody thought we were the sponsor. So over a period of time, the World Cup came to uh, the United States. We got very, very involved. Again, never putting in a penny, uh, but doing our thing. And um, uh, the Olympic Games were the next Olympic Games were in Atlanta, and um, it was you know fabulous. But the Barcelona Games was the dream team game, and it was the it was it was interesting because I spent a lot of time with Michael Jordan and, and those people. And at the time they wanted to cover the Reebok uh, uh, you know, logo and I told them no, they did it anyhow, but I told them no, because by covering it, it, it would bring more visibility to them, not less. And um, uh, you know, we able to work through all of that. And uh, um, I was a, a person that um, I, I, I never saw the downside of things. I was, you know, I was very upbeat. There were things that I stopped doing because of certain things, but um, I, I think I was an out of box thinker. I think I was a person that wasn't afraid to say no. Um, I had a a handle on sport, and and uh, it all started, you know, at Amundsen High School, and then at Bloom, and and Bradley. Uh, the school I went to was a big, a big factor. And Kansas State was a giant factor because I was in a place that I initially didn't understand. You know, it's an agricultural school. Everybody loved KU because it's, you know, it had the, you know, law school, you know, medical school, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it was hard to get our people at Kansas State to feel like they were important and they were special. Um, and, uh, but at Nike, uh, I don't want to say we had an unlimited budget, but it was a pretty good budget. You know, I signed Mike Krzyzewski and signed Dean Smith before he passed away. And, you know, early on, we signed Michael, we signed, um, uh, actually we signed, uh, a Tiger because Tiger's father, Earl went to Kansas state and he was the first black baseball player in the big eight. And, and it's kind of lost in the you know, in the annals of history. Uh, And Earl uh, came to uh, Nike when I was there uh, to visit with his son, who was a sophomore in college. And um, Earl roomed with Verl Schweitzer. And Verl Schweitzer, and he became very close friends. 
So when we got together on the campus of Nike, you know, Tiger was already indoctrinated into certain things and Tiger loved Michael Jordan. So we flew Michael in so he could meet Tiger and, you know, the rest is kind of history. So it was, uh, it, it was a great, it was a great experience. It was a great experience. You've done a lot of things in your career uh, and we, we can't cover all of them, but you were also president and CEO of the, the pro bowlers association. Right. Five years, five uh, years. What, what had happened, Chuck is I decided to retire. I was in my sixties and I decided to retire and Suzanne and I went to Europe and our plan was to stay there for a year because we had, we had made a lot of money. We had, we were very comfortable and we had lots and lots of friends in Europe. And our goal was to visit, you know, everybody and, and, and take a year, give or take. And one day, true, true story, we're in Rome and we're out eating lunch outside. And Chris, my son, who, by the way, is one of the owners of StubHub and, and uh, also owns, uh, in, in fact, their company valuation just a couple of months ago was $18 billion. So, so you know, our family is into a lot of things, right? So um, uh, we um, uh, lost my train of thought for a second. Well, you were so, having lunch in Rome. Yeah, we're having lunch in Rome. And Chris came to the table. He had just bought a pair of shoes and they were Todd shoes, but they looked like bowling rental shoes. And I said to Chris, what, what is this? And he said, dad, it's the hottest thing ever. People are buying you know, this style shoe. And then Claudine, my daughter, um, uh, got involved with Prada who was making bowling bags. And then on TV, I don't know if you remember, there was a series held in a bowling center of, you know, of, you know, the series or, you know, personalities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, it opened up with shots of the bowling center and lots of activity there. So all of a sudden three things came up that were all about bowling. So Ian Hamilton, who was the head of tennis at Nike, had quit and became the CEO of the uh, of the PBA. So Ian called me. I was in London or in uh, Rome, and he said, "Steve, come back. You and I will run this. It'll be great." So I said, "What happened to Tim Fincham?" And he said, "No, no. Tim Fincham is the head of the PGA." He said, "I'm running the PBA." So I said, what is the PB, what is the PBA? And he told me, and, and, I, and Suzanne and I kind of liked the idea. And then all these three things happened over here. And I'm a big believer in the stars being in alignment, not fanatical, but, you know. And I came back to um, uh, Seattle where the three owners lived. They were all three ex um, uh, 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 guys that worked with Bill Gates you know, in the top 10, 15, they made a ton of money. They bought the PBA and, and I talked to them about it. And I was able to put together a plan for uh, uh, ESPN to be our partner. And what I did was I gave ESPN 20% of the PBA if they would run 200 30 second spots on their four networks, which was, you know, ESPN one, ESPN two. They had something that was historical, et cetera, et cetera. And they did it. I, 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 I couldn't argue with them about doing it in prime time, but I gave them a piece of our business in order to run these commercials and start to get people to know who the players were, et cetera, et cetera. And it was an enormous benefit. And then I made a tape, not me, but we made a tape and we sent that tape to every bowling center in the country uh, to use as when the bowlers warmed up, they would play this tape and see these players. And, and um, that really worked well. So I, so I stayed, uh, so I became CEO of the uh, Professional Bowlers uh, Tour. And the next four years, I was on the cover of Bowling Today or whatever the magazine was, as the most powerful person in, in the sport. Um, and we made a lot of money. Um, we did very, very well. And it was something that I really enjoyed, even though I had had no contact with bowling. I mean, I was not a bowler, but uh, it was fun. And I went back, as I normally do, to get some of the old timers 
to get involved. So Carmen Salvino and Dick Weber, I brought all these guys back to give a visual to people who watched bowling for years uh, when there was just three networks. Um, and we we were able to, to make a lot of money and, and really do well. And, and, uh, and those bowlers elevated themselves in the community and it became a, a very nice business. In your life, you've been associated with track, football, bowling, right. and today you're associated with two of the most famous professional tennis players in history. Exactly. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing now? Okay, so I am the CEO of the Agassi Graff Foundation. Uh, we have a foundation in the United States uh, that's called the uh, Andre Agassi Foundation for Education. We have built 136 charter schools in the United States. We raised $1.5 billion in business partnerships, and we have now built our 136th school, taking care of hundreds of thousands of kids. Our goal is to build um, uh, 200 schools. We ran our program by uh, President Obama and his wife, and Arnie Duncan, who was the Secretary of Education. We had a meeting at the White House. We showed them, we told them, how we were going to do it. It was a business arrangement, not a philanthropic arrangement. Got partners. We, uh, we designated $10 million to each charter school to rebuild the facility or build from the ground up. And then they were obligated to buy the school back from us at the conclusion of three years so that the money that they gave us had a double bottom line. One bottom line was that they became much better um, citizens in their area. So they could say that they were involved in social change. And instead of it being, uh, instead of it being philanthropic, it was actually a business arrangement where they made some money, very nominal, but made some money. And it was the first time it was ever tried. And uh, so I run that program for both of them. Uh, and I run all of our businesses. So we have about 20 different businesses. One of them is we own 30 maybe 35 restaurants around the country and in Dubai and other places. We are uh, deeply uh, invested in an ed tech program to teach children to read from a preschool to about third grade, um, which we're doing in India and China and the United States. Um, uh, our, our revenue budget a year ago uh, with seven people was just short of a billion dollars. It was. 900 and something million dollars. And uh, not embarrassed to say that, you know, I made a lot of money and we were, we were, we were with Andre Agassi and Steffi Graf, two of the great tennis players of all time. But in addition to that, two people that really believed in children and giving them an opportunity. And Andre never finished eighth grade and he, know, he knew the value of education. And Stephanie was a good student, although homeschooled. Um, uh, also knew the value of dealing with young people. And her program is called Children for Tomorrow, and it's one for uh, mental health. So these kids were uh, destroyed psychologically and not physically, um, and we run you know, that program in uh, Hamburg, Germany. So uh, we have uh, uh, done really well. Our foundation uh, has about $120 million in it. We give away six to eight million dollars a year um, to programs that we feel are, you know, in sync with what we're doing, and um, uh, it's been it's been a joy. And at my age, uh, it's been more of a joy because I get to share, you know, these things, and um, and it's been great. And it, it really has been great. Well, you have lived and are living an amazing life, and this is an an unfair question. But if you had one piece of advice, because you've, you've already shared a lot of wisdom, but if you had one piece of advice to give students on how to be successful in life, what would that be? Yeah, you know, that's a, it is a complicated question uh, for sure, but it's not a complicated response. And that is that, that, uh, I, I believe that, that children and adults 
have a period of time during the day or the evening where they really speak the truth. And when I say that, what I mean is, is that I can tell you, Chuck, that you're going to make the Olympic team. We, we talk about it. You're excited about it. And then 15, 20 minutes before you go to bed, you're in that bed alone or you're with your mate or whoever. There is a 15 or 20 minute moment of honesty. And that honesty is you saying to yourself, I'm not making the Olympic team. <laughs> what, what is he talking about? Or I'm not doing this or I did this. And, and I call that the 15 minutes of truth. And during that period of time, I believe that if we can concentrate on being the best we can be and doing the things that need to be done in order for us to succeed, we can be more than we ever thought possible. And, and from my perspective, the, the ability to focus on, again, the little things, the larger things, thinking about what I could be, looking at all of the examples out there of people that have done things and taking some of those lessons. For me, that 15 minutes of truth turns into 15 minutes of, of, of I can do better, I can do more, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't think um, when children are growing up frequently, their parents tell them no much more than they say yes. Um, if I came to my father and mother and said, I want to be president of the United States, they may tell me to you know, sit in the corner, you know, don't, don't tell anybody that. I believe that we can all rise to a different level, not always fantastic, if we change our goals and objectives and look at ourselves as better than we've ever been. I just truly and honestly believe that. I grew up in Chicago. I was in a street gang. I only went to school partially. I, I did not do well grade-wise, but I did very well testing-wise. Got into college, shouldn't have been in college, never took a note in my life. And then as I began to see the opportunities out there, I said, I can do that. I can do these things. And, and for me, it's a matter of you, that person, finding a path that gets you to a place that you never thought you could be. Look, I am 79 years old. I grew up in Chicago. Um, I did not have the best upbringing. My parents worked you know, hard. And, and one day I had that aha moment. And I said, wait a minute, there are things I can do. And, and I put my head down and did them. And, and, and if I had advice, I would simply say, you have to recalibrate your feelings about yourself. And no matter what anybody says, you know you can do better. And, and from my perspective, that opens up the door to things that never thought possible. Look, I, you have two choices. You can either read about it or be read about. And, and my feeling was I'd rather be read about than read about it. And, and it was fun. It was fun. And, and, and I will tell you, Chuck, I've, I've been blessed. I really have. I, I'm, I, I think I am good. I think I am smart enough to do things. But if I wouldn't have been on a path of, of, of really engaging in that, I don't think I ever would have gotten there. And, and I have, uh, I've had an unbelievable life. I mean, uh, unbelievable. I, I, I was in China uh, at a track meet, maybe 80,000 people there. And if I wasn't the only pure white person there, I didn't see any other. I didn't see any others. You know, I was in, I was in Berlin when the wall came down. I was in Athens, Greece, when they deposed um, uh, the king that was was there. Uh, oh, I can't remember his name. Uh, I was in Nigeria when General Gowan had a military takeover and Nigerians discovered oil. Um, I've been in places and seen things that are remarkable. And I know the human capacity is limitless. Limitless. Well, Steve Miller... Thank you so much for your time and for joining us today on Espresso Yourself with Chuck. It's, it's my pleasure. And 
uh, happy to happy to do it. And if some young person takes one thing out of this, then I would feel like we really did something special. Thank you.